1997, Apple's website went dark for 24 hours, and it mysteriously showed a picture of a chocolate chip cookie, a shopping cart, and a screwdriver. What the heck could this possibly mean? Was it a hint for a new product? Let's find out. Apple Keynote Chronicles is made possible by our awesome friends at Linode. You can simplify your infrastructure and cut your cloud bills in half with Linode's Linux virtual machines. To put it simply, if it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. Hey guys, how are you all doing? If you're new here, welcome. My name is Crazy Ken, and welcome back to Apple Keynote Chronicles. And today, as usual, I'm joined by Brad, who has, for some stupid reason, agreed to go on this torturous journey with me. So thank you, Brad. I really appreciate it. I think I caught the crazy. <laughs> I just haven't passed it on yet. That's true, you haven't. Uh, but hopefully uh, if my plan works out, okay, it's not really a plan, it's just an idea baby right now. I would like to have um, other guests on the show too. It'd be cool to talk with some other people who were maybe even at these keynotes, but that's for the future. So yes, we're here again today and we're talking about two Apple events. We're just kind of quickly going through a Sabled seminar that Steve Jobs was at, but then the main event was the November 1997 Apple special event where they introduce the PowerPC G3 processor. Kind of like today, you know, we're using Apple's new chips, the M1 and all this stuff. This was kind of like that. Not really, but kind of. It was an all new processor for these new products they were releasing as part of Steve Jobs' new strategy for Apple. So this was kind of a big deal. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So I can't find a video online for this Sabled seminar, but I do have a transcript. I do have a link in the show notes. And this is actually our first time covering a Sabled seminar and Steve Jobs was speaking at it. So in short, what was Sabled? Well, Sabled seminars were a series of trade shows and these seminars tailoring to the pre-press industry and desktop publishing. You know, we were talking about creative content and pre-press and design work and how the Mac is so big in those markets. So it made sense for Steve Jobs to represent Apple at the Sabled seminars. So because the Macintosh was huge in those industries, it just made sense. And these seminars started before the Mac existed in 1981 by Jonathan Sable. But ultimately, the event was discontinued in 2005. And that's probably why many newer computer users have no idea what it is. But it did have a good run. I did not know about them. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So Jobs recaps a few things during the seminar, like the Microsoft partnership. Also Rhapsody, the next gen operating system. He says it's on track and will come out as a server product first, which I always thought was interesting. I really should look into Apple's interest with servers more because they don't do that. Like they had the X serve and all that stuff, but like they don't sell any of that anymore. But yeah, that was a big focus for them was to make Rhapsody as a server product before it was a client OS. And we'll be talking about that much more in a future episode. There was a dedicated scene from a keynote where he talks about what eventually was called Mac OS X, Mac OS X server. So he also mentions the Newton. He says it's important, but Mac OS is the core of Apple. And as we know, the Newtons died off shortly after 1997. And then he hints at some problems to fix, such as Apple's inventory, which we'll dive into during the main event. So I think Steve Jobs was kind of teasing what he was going to be talking about in this next event, because inventory was a problem. Now it's November 1997. It's time for the Apple special event. And before the keynote, the Apple website has been down. It was down for a whole day and it was replaced with three pictures, a chocolate chip cookie, an empty shopping cart, and a screwdriver. So what the heck does that stuff mean? Did you try to take a guess or did you already know going into it? I took guesses, but I really, the chocolate chip cookie was kind of obvious to me looking back at this. I was like, oh, chip processor, CPU, but I did not. The screwdriver was like the only thing I was really confused about. The shopping cart, I was like, okay, like a shopping thing. I wasn't really sure what, but the screwdriver, I really didn't know. So what about, what about you? <laughs> I, I mean, the chip thing I can kind of confused me. I think maybe he was just talking about the internet or something literally oh, right before it when he introduced it. So I thought cookies, is this like, thinking. like are, were cookies a thing to bring? <laughs> but I, so chip, I guess I... I can't think of a better representation of saying chip. You know, we have a new chip. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's kind of the evolution of icons even because you don't see a whole shopping cart used as an icon really anymore. Right. It was it's like generally a, a basket. <laughs> and you don't see a screwdriver alone even on the App Store or whatever. It's a screwdriver and a hammer like crossing each other. And, yeah, and like they weren't even like icons. They were like actual like alpha channel photographs yeah. of like a shopping <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> but it was 1997, third visual look. It's look. interesting to see the evolution of how things It come. totally is. So they open up with the Think Different ad. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the square pegs, and the round holes. Fun fact for any everybody, uh, Robin Williams was the star of a show called The Crazy Ones. It was a one season thing. It was inspired by that. Ah, Have you watched that? I haven't. I did not know that that was the inspiration behind it. I mean, I don't know if it was like the inspiration from like the writer and creator perspective, but in the TV show itself, like in the first episode, they talk about the Apple ad. I will just say, as we're on the topic, even that we're talking about the evolution, it's very Apple what they're doing right there. There's the cookie, the shopping cart, the thing. We see the evolution of uh, how the icons came to be and all mm -hmm. this and that, but also the reveal that's very reminiscent of how he introduced the first iPhone and everything. Dude, I'm too. so glad you say that because this is kind of the first real Steve note. Like it's not a business thing mm. or like a status report thing or a Sabled seminar. This is like Steve Jobs' first real Steve note where he has the suspense. Mm -hmm. You're totally, that's a good way to put it because it was like we're releasing three products, an iPod, yeah. a phone, and an internet communicator. Because even the, even the last event was a Macworld thing. There is a different vibe. I can see why Apple host their own events now because you don't have to put up with the pageantry or the handoff or the niceties of the beginnings of someone else introducing your keynote. And, and that did change because even the iPhone thing was, the first iPhone, that was still a Mac world, mm. but it still felt like a Steve note. But one of the main reasons they eventually moved away from Mac world was because of the scheduling. They mm. wanted to announce and release their products on their schedule and not have to fight the Mac gotcha. world convention schedule. But yeah, we'll t we'll cover that in a future future episode. Mm. The last Macworld Apple was that was Macworld 2009. But for today, it's Apple's own special event. Steve comes out on stage and we're back at the Flint Center. The Flint Center was where the first Macintosh was revealed and lots of long applause. No turtleneck yet. You know, he hasn't evolved that look yet. He's wearing kind of like a waistcoat sort of thing. I, I, I again, a fashion, fashion choices are always a topic of uh, discussion here. <laughs> um, this one is interesting. I call this one the... Uh, what stood out I, I would call this uh high school principal steve jobs uh, that's what he looked like a grizzly adams high school what, principal or what, something you like the beard you like yeah. his beard <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a different uh, uh yeah the full beard uh robust yeah not the turtleneck yet mm -hmm. it's a uh, powerful presence yeah absolutely so he teases the three pictures he's going to go through one at a time first was the cookie a very different chip is what he said. And there was some laughs and applause there. And chip is a thing Apple still says, like M1 chip. You know, they still use chip for, you know, hmm. system on a chip. You know, they just abbreviate it to chip or CPU. They just say chip. It's really simple. So this is the first time where they announced the PowerPC G3 processor. And it's funny because like today, you know, Apple just recently announced their all new iMac with Apple Silicon and they've been rolling out the M1 products and all that stuff. And this was kind of like that. M1 from Intel is a big transition from PowerPC to PowerPC G3, like in comparison, but it's still like a new chip and it was a, a huge thing for the future of the Mac. And this was helped made possible by the AIM Alliance, which stood for Apple, IBM, and Motorola, the AIM Alliance. So a big upgrade with this generation three chip was it had a separate bus for backside cache and up to 266 megahertz clock. So Jobs talks about this a lot. There's even a future keynote where he talks about the megahertz myth. It may sound like lower megahertz is actually slower, but that's not true all the time. So he talks about, even though it's like half the megahertz, quote unquote, of like a Wintel system with a Pentium 2, you know, it's half the megahertz. It's, it's still like twice as fast. Well, the next keynote, they spend a good portion of it talking about Rose it is twice as fast. Roasting yeah. Intel, which is funny because then who do they transition to a few years later? <laughs> Intel! <laughs> hey, Intel, remember all those things we made fun of you back then when we put your processor on a snail and had it walk across the screen to show how slow it was? Hey, can we just forget about that, man? We kind of need you. The power PC G5 is turning our notebook into a frying pan. Uh, but that's in the future. Anyway, <laughs> so... For example, Jobs would like to compare the new PowerPC G3 to the Pentium 2 a lot. So it was 67 square millimeters, 6 watts of power compared to the Pentium 2, which was 203 square millimeters, and it used 43 watts of power. You could fry an egg on this thing. <laughs> that was the thing he always said. He was like, you could fry an egg on it. Uh, so I, I still think it's just so funny how they roast Intel, but then they... Intel clearly innovated because they caught up with the performance per watt game where they could crank out the performance 
but not put out as much heat energy as much. So then Jobs liked to use bite marks a lot to show benchmarks between the two chips. So according to the numbers he showed, the bite marks integer benchmark was 7.53 for the G3 compared to the 4.24 on the Pentium 2. And the floating point test was 5.74 to 5.0. I'm not a computer programmer expert, but in short integers are whole numbers, one, two, three, four. Floating point values can be decimals. That's what float versus integer means there in a super basic term. Then he talked about Photoshop tasks. The G3 266 took 611 seconds to run all the scripts and the Pentium 2 at 300 megahertz. Again, higher clock speed could be faster, but it's not. It took 713 seconds to run all the Photoshop scripts. So we have this all new chip. We need something to shove it into, right? So he introduces the G3 product family, the G3 desktop, which was like the flatter kind of computer. You'd put the monitor on top of it, right? The G3 mini tower, where it was like a much taller computer sitting next to your monitor, and then a G3 power book, a notebook computer. And the desktop model started at 1999. And the power book on that one slide said 5699, but I'm pretty sure that was the max spec model. <laughs> the highest end notebook was 5699. So PowerBook G3, the G3 desktop, and the G3 mini tower. And he said the products have been re-engineered from the ground up, but we know much bigger redesigns are waiting in the wings, which we'll talk about in the next episode, because even though they've been like re-engineered, they still look, well, you know, beige, right? They look kind of like boxes for the most part. They don't have a new design twist, but we know that's coming soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, is it? Oh, yes. So then Jobs talks about a quick update about Mac OS 8. Two million copies have been sold since summer, so that's doing pretty well. And then Phil Schiller comes out on stage. I think this is the first time Phil Schiller is in a Steve note. Well, right? I, I, I mean, we haven't seen him, I, I don't believe, in any of the previous ones that we watched. But yeah, Phil Schiller is going to be a recurring character. He's in a ton of future Apple keynotes. Yep. He hasn't been in the recent product events, but he also recently got promoted to Apple Fellow. I guess technically he's not the senior vice president of product marketing anymore. But Apple Fellow is a huge feather in your cap. That's a ginormous gold feather. <laughs> so we see him come out on stage and he's there to demo the G3 Mini Tower versus, quote, the best Pentium you can buy, which was, according to Apple, it was a compact machine, 300 megahertz Pentium 2. They run the Photoshop script, so it's 30 actions put together. It's all automated. And they use a bunch of graphics they used for the Mac OS 8 promo video stuff. And the G3 finished about 20 seconds faster than the P2, which was about twice as fast, even though, again, you know, megahertz myth. The megahertz on paper was lower than 300, but in practice, it was about twice as fast doing these Photoshop tasks. Well, speaking of the tasks, I mean, did it stand out to you at all? It was interesting. I'm kind of glad we've moved beyond. When you say they run the demos, I mean, they run the demos. There's a lot of time spent on stage in these where they, they run the thing and it's kind of, you know, be awkward of like, just Dude, like giving oh the voiceover of what's happening. Oh, here we are almost done. How much did you hear? Like, almost, and got it. Yeah, I'm glad they don't do that crap anymore because it is kind of weird where it's just kind of like awkward, like waiting for Well, something. and they're like, it's not automated. It's like clicking it and starting it at the, you know, trying mm -hmm. to get it at the same time. And here we go. Or three, a lot of three, two, one, two, click. <laughs> yeah. And there was that one time, like Phil missed the other button. Yeah. But it was on the Pentium. So he's like, oh, I'll just give it a yeah. head start. Click. <laughs> And I don't remember what keynote it was in. There was even that time where they did the demo and then they did it again. Jobs was like, you want to see that again? And I'm just like, no, I don't. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> and, then, and then he does it a third time. <laughs> it's like, we get it. It's faster. It, they're really pushing it hard. I mean, they keep saying screams too. This thing screams. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, they say screams and the other one was hot. hot. This like, is, this is hot, Yeah, which is even something I remember Jobs saying, even at, like, the iPhone 4 thing, the retina display, he's like, this is really hot. That yeah, was I was words. wondering where that came from. They're so adamant about, they're saying hot, and it, it's kind of weird, because they're also talking about how hot the Pentium processor is. That's true, gets. they were talking about literal but then, heat. And then sometimes <laughs> they're talking about, like, the, their computer chip in a sexual way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, there's a future keynote we'll cover where they actually talk about, can a computer, like, be powerful and sexy and, like, Jobs on the slide, literally? says power plus sex 
<laughs> and like oh, a yeah. mar- and like a marker font. Yeah. It's freaking amazing. Uh, We're getting ahead of ourselves though. So <laughs> they do the demos. It's kind of repetitive, but I guess back then it was fun. So yeah, the G3 was about twice as fast in that regard. Then they do an After Effects demo. They render motion video and all that stuff in Adobe After Effects, which is like Photoshop for video. And that's actually where Phil did the three, two, one, and he missed the click <laughs> yeah. on the Pentium. So he gave it a bit of a head start. And the G3 was just way faster than the P2. And actually, it's so funny that you mentioned that right here in my notes. I just say lots of odd silence. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's weird. Especially later when they do like the Shockwave or the Macromedia Director demos, you hear like the sound effects playing oh, awkwardly yeah. too. And it's like a couple decibels louder than their mics. So it's like just loud, random sound effects. Yeah, it's not very refined. No. There's, there, there's moments too where Steve's talking, but then Phil is like also mic'd up and saying it's done. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. I was wondering if splices of different videos got clipped in. It's... It was like watching NASCAR. But no one in the audience was cheering and they were all electric cars. So there was like no noise. That's what it was like. You were watching a race, but it was so awkwardly quiet. (laughs) So now the PowerBook G3 versus the NEC Versa with a Pentium. This is when they did the Macromedia Director 6. This was an interactive animation speed test. The G3 was playing way smoother. Then... Phil is just like, okay, well, we've, we've shown these like more advanced speed tests, but how about basic things you use every day? So he showed Word, Microsoft Word 6 opening, and it was just like super quick, and that got applause. He opened up Excel, it opened immediately, that got applause. So even just those basic things, the PowerPC G3 processor was able to launch apps so fast. Do you think that translated, so, you know, they're running these scripts and everything like that. Do you think that that would have translated in just day-to-day use as well? I still think it could have translated because it's kind of hard to think about sometimes how much faster things have become until you go back and use the old thing. Like, I'll launch Photoshop on, like, a 68K Mac. And it takes like 15 seconds to like render a Gaussian blur, for example, Mm. something that can easily be done in real time now. For like a 512 by 512 image, you click render and it gives you a modal progress bar. So like you're you're stuck inside there. You can't do anything else in the app or maybe even in the system, I'm not sure. And it's just chugging along and then it like slowly paints down the screen and it's like, wow. We take the speed for granted. (laughs) Oh, no, we really do. Now that you say this, I recently had to help get someone's Not even that old, but maybe a 2011, you know, PC laptop hooked up to a uh, printer at their work. Oh, that sounds like a great way to spend (laughs) eight days straight. It it definitely was. They were like, wow, I didn't realize it was going to be this complicated. I was like, I did. (laughs) Dude, printers and Bluetooth are like the only technologies that are like still so ubiquitous, but have like never gotten better. Never gotten better, <laughs> n- never improved. But either way, it was, uh, you know, that, that was the thing as we're going to like test print something, even opening a PDF, the amount of time that it took was enough to like disconnect me from the process oh that I'm gosh, in. Oh my gosh, that So, painful. you know, I, I can definitely see that's what Steve has always aimed to do. That's what Apple has always been doing is removing friction from whatever you're trying to do. So. Even if it's a little bit, I think, you know, they've always been about those incremental improvements. Absolutely. So that takes care of the very different chip. Or as Steve said, that takes care of the cookie. (laughs) (laughs) That's the way the cookie crumbles. (laughs) Now, the shopping cart. A very different store. So... Like, this is the genesis of so many things we use today. It's so cool going back and seeing where it started. This was the coolest part, I thought. Uh, This part's freaking awesome, yeah. So, Jobs talks about how they are repartnering with CompUSA. Because they have these stores, they have these retail stores, but there's really no national chain. So, they want to get their Apple products into CompUSA stores. So, they're working with them to make the national buying experience better. And they want to put an Apple store within a store inside every comp usa so the whole idea was you would go into the comp usa store but there would be this apple store within a store that would have the apple branding the think different branding and best of all people who knew what they were doing trained mac specialists and just again for context apple stores didn't exist yet they wouldn't exist for another four ish years so store within a store was the way they had to do this did you ever go to a Comp USA? I don't think there don't, was a Comp USA near where I grew up. I've never seen a Comp yeah, USA. I've never seen it. Yeah. So I think I vaguely remember hearing about this maybe in the news. I couldn't go visit. 
but I was pretty familiar with and followed this years later when they did it with Best Buy, which was similarly a big deal to do mm, right. the store within a store. They, right. So you're seeing the beginnings of, I don't know what year it was, they eventually went to Best Buy, but this is the pioneering of that mm -hmm. and really looking at it in the context of today and now and what Steve was going to do. They nailed it and they nailed There's so many great things about it. They didn't have the money for opening up retail stores or doing all these yeah, big yet. things. What mm -hmm. a way to differentiate yourself within the current context and stand out. It's it's some it's a real genius move to um you know, even in the end, if there let's say we know there's a big difference between the Mac and the PC, but even if there weren't, just on an aesthetics level, this would mm -hmm. still be a genius move. And transitioning into that, they had a QuickTime VR video rotation demo mm -hmm. where you can actually like click and drag around and have like a 360 view of the store, and the Apple part totally stood out. So think of it like Google Street View, but in 1997. You know, you're inside the store looking around with QuickTime. Oh, that was really cool, too, just how they were showing off. I didn't realize they had 360 kind yeah. of uh, stuff like that even yeah. in 1997. I like how Jobs was like, see the carpet? Because <laughs> it looks nice. It's like a nice carpeted section of the store. But yeah, like, you know, Apple didn't open their first store. I think it was like in Virginia, but it was like in 2001. They didn't open that for a couple years now. But look at how well it's worked today, like with online store shopping and stuff going up, a lot of brick and mortar is going down, but Apple is one of those few exceptions where their brick and mortar stores is increasing. The foot traffic is going up. They are still so wildly successful. So then Jobs is like, we're gonna add something really great to the stack. A new Apple website with a new online store. Not only are they doing this new store within a store thing, but they're doing an all new online shopping experience. And you know, it's so easy to shop online nowadays. It's so convenient, but this was 1997. Like it was totally different back then. So there's this all new Apple website with an all new store. It's like a simple, beautiful grid of products. It's very visual, especially for 1997. And Steve Jobs broke it into three things. Like each Mac you wanna buy has three basic configuration options, good, better, best. Those are the stock configurations. But then, even though that online buying experience was really cool and hardly anyone was doing that with e-commerce at the time, there was something else very big that he introduced. This is something Apple still does today and it was a big shift. I literally just used it to buy the new iMac. BTO, not the rock band, <laughs> but build to order where you can go and customize your computer. You want a different processor, you want a different hard drive. You have all these drop down menus. You can just choose what you want and they will build the computer to the specs you order on the website. And uh, during the demo, he goes to the website, he shows a Newton device. Like I was not expecting that. There's the, you could like still get the Newton apparently. Did oh, you see that? I, no, was, I, didn't, I didn't even catch that Yeah, part. it was on the website still, but like, mm -mm, it's about to get killed off. So I thought that was kind of funny. So Steve goes to do a BTO configuration of the new G3 mini tower with lots of upgrades. He just keeps clicking the like upgrade pop-up <laughs> menus and it ends up being like over $5,000. And he's like, you can see why we're doing this. <laughs> That's a lot of upsells, dude. That's a lot of nice money. It's amazing how much it is like the same experience though today. It is, yeah, like pretty much the only difference is it's radio buttons instead of pop-up menus. It's yeah. the same freaking thing. And of course, like on the server end, there's different software doing this because this was probably... It's more, it's like the fact that you have that level of, you know, BTO ability on a website in 1997, mm -hmm. like, I mean, it's so ahead of the game. It's, it's, it's exactly what a lot of places don't even let you do now. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And on a technical level, I don't remember yet 100% sure what they were using, but they were probably using Next's web objects technology or something similar because that mm. was part of the acquisition. They don't do that nowadays. Web objects isn't a thing that's really used anymore, but back then... They were probably using that or something similar. So it ends up being a $7,000 system, but Jobs is just like, it's a good day today, so I'm gonna buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> he was so funny. Like he always had humor in his presentations and that's just another reason why I really think this was like his first real Steve note. He has the humor, he has the suspense, you know, with like the cookie and the cart, like what does this stuff mean? He doesn't have his look dialed in yet and he has a beard, but it's like, you know, it's getting there. It's getting there. I mean, I think he has the humor because he's building. That's the reason that we love Apple and that what I feel like he was doing and that it carries through today is like they're making the products they want to see in the world. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. And he's, you can tell he's excited to show this oh, stuff yeah. off. He's proud of it. The same way, you know, when he's joking and laughing and building another one or showing a demo three times in a row. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, save me. He, he's doing that with the same sort of glee that he had for showing the 1984 ad. 
you know. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. So then he goes into the checkout process. You get the options. You can because it's 1997. You can still mail it in or fax it in to do the order. But he's like, I'm just going to choose the internet option because that's kind of the whole reason why they're doing this demo. And I thought it was funny. He's typing in a credit card number, <laughs> and he's like, This is an expired number. <laughs> And I also noticed as he's going through it, he says boom a lot. Like that's another catchphrase you hear him say a ton. So like that's another Steve-ism. He says boom, 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 boom. Like click a button, boom, it's done. I've actually noticed I say that. I probably <laughs> got it from him. I have no idea. <laughs> so the Apple online store with build-to-order configurations from a 50,000 foot view, they're the same today. It's what we still use. And this was the genesis of that in 1997. So now the screwdriver. What could that possibly mean? We'll talk about that in a sec. But because we're talking about websites and web applications and web objects and all this stuff that goes on behind the scenes, it's just kind of like, we sometimes forget, like the user experience is so easy to use. We sometimes forget all the stuff that is going on behind the scenes. How does all that stuff get made? Well, there's ways to do it. There's these developers making all this stuff. They need the tools and the infrastructure to build these web applications and these websites so they work and they're easy for the end user. And that, is where I like to talk about our awesome friends at Linode, the awesome people that help make this podcast possible. So with Linode, you can simplify your infrastructure and cut your cloud bills in half with their Linux virtual machines. You can develop, deploy, and scale your modern applications faster and easier. So whether you're doing that personal project or managing that much bigger workload, you deserve simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solutions. So here's the cool thing. Just for listening to this podcast, this is gonna be the easiest $100 you'll ever make in your life. Just for listening to this podcast, you can get started with Linode with $100 in free credit. And you can find all the details at linode.com slash computerclan. The link is in the show notes. Go ahead and click on that. And the cool thing is they have data centers all around the world with the same simple and consistent pricing. So you don't have to worry about the locations having different things. It's all the same. And you can just basically choose the data center closest to you and keep it easy. And on top of that, they also have 24-7, 365, human, not robot, tech support. No tiers, no handoffs, regardless of your plan size. It's all the same great support. Doesn't matter what you buy. And you can choose between shared and dedicated compute instances, or you can use that $100 in credit on S3 compatible object storage, managed Kubernetes, and a ton more. They have a whole solutions page. You go click on that. You can see a bunch of use cases where this stuff actually is usable in a real world application. Really, to put it simply, if it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. So visit linode.com slash computerclan and click the create free account button to get started with that $100 of free credit. And the other awesome thing is when you do that, you're actually supporting this podcast because we are partners with Linode and they help us fund this. They're freaking awesome. I've been working with these guys for a couple of years now. They are great. A hundred bucks. I've worked a lot harder for a lot less. I was going to say, <laughs> so have I. Like you can sit and listen to a podcast and boom, there's a hundred dollars in your pocket and you can use that for Linode. So back to 1997 websites. I don't think Lin Linode existed back then, <laughs> but it would have been cool <laughs> if it existed back then. But we have web objects and other next technologies and all that stuff. So we covered the website, build the order configurations, but how do those things get built? Well, they don't just appear out of nowhere when you buy them on the website, right? I think you're going to need a different kind of factory. You're going to need a very different factory. And that's what the screwdriver was. So Steve talked about how every single product is going to be build to order in the factory. No huge inventory. And there, there's going to be tons of config choices because if you go through all those menus and multiply everything out, like there's like a bajillion different combinations. So it's quite a bit different than the original Macintosh days where they would have them on a factory with a big inventory. So Steve plays this video showing off the factory. They show a lot of snapping components and diagnostic software and it's kind of fun to see them assembling these like modular things in the big power mat cases because I've fiddled with those myself. You open them up and there's like the G3 opens up kind of like a, have you ever opened a power mat G3? It's kind of interesting. Before the blue and white. This was like uh, the No, page. not before the blue and white. So you like take the, you like have to lay it down. You take the cover off and like it kind of folds out like a butterfly, like the two halves kind of fold out. And it's kind of modular, but that's how you would open it up and swap out components and stuff like that. And it's kind of cool to see how it works in the factory with that behind the scenes look. So they have that all new factory in place to help keep the inventory lower, manage that better, and do those custom build to order configurations for the users using the new online shopping experience. And that's a lot of how it works today. It's so cool to see this genesis. Of it's crazy that they had the forethought to get ahead of it like that, where, I mean, can you think, I mean, I couldn't 
think about buying a Mac that I didn't custom build today. But, you know, again, talking about the retail store being the main source of how people got computers or thought about buying anything back then, you likely weren't going, you know, you're going to get whatever stock configuration they have on the shelf. And if you were advanced enough to order something, I mean, what was the option before that? You'd have a, a magazine, you know, where, where you'd <laughs> fill out, the, you know, you'd you do might the check just... mark and fac fax it in. But yeah. you know, how much window shopping do we do? Like we've done, a, like, hey, let's spec this out. Like you couldn't really, how much more work would it be to You're spec right. something we, out we, in the We past? literally just did that. Yeah, we bought an iMac. I'm like over your shoulder, like click that button, click that button, more RAM. Yeah, like mm -hmm. doing that in the early 90s without a website, without BTO, like I'm sure there were maybe some retailers that had like special phone support where it's like, yeah, we can get the parts in and do that for, I have no idea, but it definitely was not offered by Apple First Party until 1997. Speaking of online stuff, Jobs did give credit to Michael Dell. We were talking about Michael Dell earlier because according to Steve Jobs, Dell pioneered the online buying experience in 1996, the online store kind of like what Apple's doing now a year later. I was kind of intrigued. Like he puts a picture of Michael Dell on the, on the screen, like what's Michael doing here? <laughs> so for context, he's, was he officially the founder or was he a co-founder? I don't remember, but Dell computers. I don't know about, yeah, yeah. that, but he's, yeah. he's a billionaire a billion times over, super rich guy. So this was a funny story I actually did not know until I watched this keynote. Jobs said, Dell came to Next to write the online store software with their web objects technology. Then, as we talked about in the previous episodes, this was big, Apple acquired Next. And that means the people who wrote the Dell online store are now Apple employees. And I don't remember it directly or remember specifically if Steve told Dell about it or if Dell just caught wind of it. But allegedly, Dell said he'd shut down the online store if he were Apple's CEO and he'd give money back to the shareholders. <laughs> oh, I mean, I think what Dell was saying that about Apple in general, he was not, not just the online store. Michael Dell was saying that they were asked, what would you do if you were the CEO of Apple? Not, not just the online store. He was saying, he'd oh, I thought, he, I thought they were just talking about the online no, store. No, he's talking about Apple in general. Michael Dell was saying, I'd shut the whole thing down. Oh, the whole thing. The oh, whole thing. I... Give the, shut the whole thing down and give the money back to the shareholders. Apple is a company. Oh, crap. I clearly wasn't paying attention to that part then, but yeah. Okay, that's way worse now. Yeah, the whole thing, because you couldn't give the shareholders just the money uh, back dude, for shutting down the, screw uh, the that. Uh, screw online that. store. Oh, my gosh. So, Jobs was like, well, I thought that was rude. <laughs> so, I looked it up. And he literally puts a dictionary definition of the word rude up there. And it's like, oh, that was rude. <laughs> <laughs> And then I thought it was hilarious. He puts Michael Dell's face back on the screen and Jobs is like, we're coming after you, buddy. And like a target graphic with like a crosshair. Goes <laughs> a weird looking crosshair. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, I thought it was, uh, this is classic. Uh, I mean, basically, yeah, he's given a, a backhanded compliment. He's being like, uh, yeah, okay, they had the biggest web store, but we made it and uh, we work for Apple and we have the better thing now. And it's so funny how it's like the same technology that made Dell's website. And now that it's owned by Apple, it's so weird that he's just now like, oh no, I had to shut it down. Let's see, I think um, Michael Dell's net worth, I mean, he's still doing all right for himself. I think it's like 50 bill, let's see. It is 50.2 bill, okay. I'm pretty good at guessing things. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the dude you're getting Adele commercials. Oh, I oh yes. The, they oh were like gosh, ubiquitous. There's uh, I think the guy's name was Steve. He became like a little celebrity. There's this whole ad campaign of dude you're getting Adele, <laughs> and uh, it's like a, a stoner or something. You know, oh, it was kind dude. of uh, it was uh, it was all over the place. People were it was it was kind of like the Budweiser. Uh, uh, what's up? Whatever. <laughs> there was, it was one of those things, dude, you're getting Adele. I mean, everybody was saying that, I remember. Well, now I'm looking this up. <laughs> dude, you're getting Adele. <laughs> hey, I'm Ben Curtis. I'm an actor here in New York City. Oh, and... th this was the guy that actually, it's a Tech Insider video. This is the guy who, Ben Curtis was the dude, you're getting Adele guy. Yeah. He here's, the com here's one of the commercials. Hello, Mrs. Lindsay. William. Hello, Stephen. You're not by any chance computer shopping, are you? Mm-hmm. If I can get some help. Just call or go online. Tell them what you want, and right to your front door comes America's favorite PC. Thanks, Stephen. Dude, you're getting a Dell. <laughs> easy to buy, easy to own, easy as Dell. <laughs> That was the big thing. At the, I mean, I, I again, I'm, I'm fuzzy on the years, but mm -hmm. definitely at the the time, the computer world was Dell's, and it was the gateway and gateway stores and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. 
One of my first PCs was a Gateway. No. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, compacts at schools, they had compacts, and mm-hmm. that's what uh, they're doing the comparisons with. Yeah, a lot they did on speed tests with a lot of compacts, yeah. So then Jobs was saying, we're going to be second to nobody in this industry, including Dell. So we made a special Think Different ad for Michael Dell, and it's with Muhammad Ali, mm. like punching the camera and stuff. I actually, I, <laughs> that, I love that ad. It was great. And I love that he played it twice. That was another like little Steveism. He does that sometimes, and he did that with the iPhone 3G ad, where he'll play it and people will cheer, and he'll be like, "You want to see that again?" <laughs> and he'll play it again. <laughs> I think that's his way of uh, reinforcing that you know we're in the fight here. Oh, yeah. We are coming at you. You know, you're talking about Steve Jobs' sense of humor. I mean, that comes through even in that ad. Absolutely, I mean, it's hundred uh, percent. It's a very fun, playful competitiveness. Mm-hmm. So then a nice quote that kind of sums it all up from Steve in the keynote is, we're fundamentally changing the way we do business without losing sight of why we do business to make the best tools for people who think creatively. He's turning it around, man. They're they're getting back on track. So the chip, the shopping cart, and the screwdriver. This keynote was very important because it was the first introduction of the PowerPC G3, which is imperative for what we're going to be talking about next. The beginning of the online store, which is used every day still, all these decades later, like it's still being used. Everyone's got an online store now and they're build to order factory, managing that inventory better. Build to order options, BTO configs on the Apple website. We still use that today. So what's next? Brad, what do you think we're gonna be talking about next? Maybe their first I product? We always see the lowercase I, you know, that's like a ubiquitous thing now with Apple products, iPhones, iPads. Well, it all started somewhere. So, in the next episode, we're going to be talking about the keynote with the first all-new, completely redesigned Mac. Not just like an existing case with re-engineered insides, but an all-new, completely redesigned Mac. That's what we're talking about next, and it was Apple's first iProduct, iMac. Oh, it's a good one. This is a good one, and it's good timing, too, because right now, in 2021, Apple just released the new, new iMacs. Mm. Very much ties in. But I will say with this one, I mean, the keynote that we're talking about, it is, the, as you said, it's kind of the first real Steve note. There is, or, you know, the future of what would be laid down. It is a very much, I would say this lays the groundwork. There's there's elements we talked about that aren't as uh, refined as they would be in the past with the demos and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, the icons, how they're introducing stuff. But this is really... You can see the foundations being built of all future keynotes, even, you know, up to what they do today. Yeah, Um, this was a good one. It was really good. And you can see the evolution of things, the evolution of people, you know, whether it's uh, Phil Schiller. Oh, yeah. um, And uh, it's Apple. And it's before. It's kind of playing with the old stuff. You you can even see the hints of how they're uh, hyping up, how they're going to talk about chips, how they're going to talk about specs, the way that they put it up on the screen. You can see how they kind of simplify things or get to the point of how this is going to benefit the person or even how they talk about chips all the way carrying through. This isn't that much different from how they're talking about debuting the M1 or anything like that. So um, this is a fascinating one to watch if you're a fan of the keynotes and have been watching for a long time. Oh, yeah. This is one of my favorite Steve notes coming up here. And uh, I have an original iMac as well. And uh, it's the design is still so freaking cool. So we're going to be talking about the first iMac keynote in the next episode. So feel free to subscribe and follow. It's free. And you'll get these new episodes delivered to you every other Monday because we like to make your Monday a fun day. But also, if you'd like, I do have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash crazyken, crazy with a K. The link is in the show notes. And you get an ad-free version of this podcast there. Plus a lot of other stuff. Honestly, I've looked at other Patreon pages and stuff like that. Not to toot my own horn, but we give a lot of fun stuff away for only the $2 tier, which is the cheapest tier. So you get so much more than just the ad-free stream. You get a lot of other cool stuff. Plus, you're helping support the podcast and the whole computer clan, which houses the podcast, and you help us keep our stuff free for everyone else. So thank you for your support. And another thing that helps us a lot is leaving a rating on your podcast platform of choice. Hey, five stars is a cool number. So if you like the show, feel free to leave a five-star review or a five-star rating. But, you know, if you didn't or it's too early, you absolutely don't have to. Since we believe in choice, (laughs) you obviously don't have to do that. But your support is greatly appreciated. Thanks for listening. And thanks again, Linode, for making this possible. Feel free to get that $100 of credit. To put it simply, if it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. Linode.com slash computer clan. That link is in the show notes. Go check it out. Until next time, all there is left to say is thanks for sticking with me. Catch the crazy and pass it on.